Welcome to The Loins of History, a podcast connecting the past to the present and improving historical and political literacy. I'm your host, Colin, and I'm joined by my co-host, Jay. And we're going to continue our series on the fall of the French Third Republic. And Jay, do you want to start us off with some shout outs? Yeah, for sure. Shout out to Russell Reno Limprecht, Randy Stevens, Neo83, Ian Hentz, Evan H., and Kyle Scott. Thank you for subscribing to our YouTube channel. And we look forward to giving more shout outs to those of y'all that subscribe or give us a five star review and a comment on other platforms. And this week, we are super excited to continue our fall of the French Third Republic, which lasted from 1871 to 1940 and collapsed with the Nazi invasion during World War II. We started this series talking about some political considerations and how the Third Republic was born after the Germans wrecked them the first time, or the Prussians that created Germany in the palace at Versailles. We talked about you know, things like the, the Dreyfus Affair. We talked about World War I. We've talked about the newspapers and the media. Uh, we've talked about the Munich Conference. And now we are here. We have finally arrived at how on earth did we get to World War I? And, you know, looking at this broad series of the fall of empires, the collapse of civilizations, the themes that we've been trying to draw out have been why do nations collapse and what can be done to prevent it? And, you know, looking, you know, connecting history to current events here, there's a lot of feeling here in the West, here in the United States in particular, that like we're in this era of relative decline. You know, people look at China on the up and up. Um, some might think of Russia, even though, you know, Russia, Ukraine has kind of called that into question. Russia's on the up and up recovering from its Cold War hard times. And it just feels like we're in this era of decline. You know, maybe we're not the greatest anymore. So we really want to look back at the history. Uh, we've talked about the Roman Empire. We've talked about the Han Dynasty. We've talked about the Byzantine Empire. We've talked about the Bronze Age civilizations. And now we're talking about the French Third Republic. So this episode is really going to cover basically the year of 1939. And we're going to take a little bit different structure in some of our previous episodes. And I'm going to try to do less like narrative lecturing. <laughs> and we're going to just bring out really the key points. And the first key point here that I want to talk about is the role of the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact and how it led to the, the initiation of World War II. I think I think most of our listeners may have at least heard of the Molotov Ribbentrop Pact, but you know, our last episode was on the Munich Conference, which brought us to you know late September, early October of 1938. The Molotov Ribbentrop Pact was signed in August of 1939. And what was going on in the interim when before Molotov, which was the Russian foreign minister, and Ribbentrop, who was the Nazi foreign minister, before they got into this, essentially the British and the French were in negotiations with the Soviets to try to form a military alliance. And in World War I, we had this, this triple alliance or triple entente, as opposed to the central powers between Great Britain, France, and Russia. And it was meant to contain Germany. Um, and France and Great Britain were trying to basically do it again. They were trying, they, they, they saw that one reason why Imperial Germany and the Kaiser were not able to mass as many forces against France the first time was because they had to protect East Prussia. And Russia and Germany at that time shared a, shared a very large border. Poland didn't exist. At the beginning of, of World War One, well, this this go around there was no formal military alliance. Well, the French and the British kind of hemmed and they hawed because you know it's not Imperial Russia anymore; it's the Soviet Union. They're communists, of which even the government in France, uh, the radical socialists, they were not the biggest fans of the communist, and the British definitely were not. In addition to just the historical rivalry 
between Russia and Great Britain. Russia and France have been traditional allies, whereas Russia and Great Britain have not always gotten along. So they were him and they were Han. Well, essentially, from Stalin's perspective <clears throat> and Russia's perspective, they they were like, you know, we're looking at the strategic blunder after strategic blunder from the British and the French. We don't want to be drug into a war over a country that we don't care about, i.e. Poland. As a matter of fact, we would like to see Poland also wiped off the face of the map because East Poland used to belong to us. And when Hitler got that word, he immediately dispatched Ribbentrop. And that's how we got this pact. So, you know, one of the, which again, just so that it's said, this pact basically was a non-aggression pact between the Soviet Union and Germany in August of 1939, where they promised not to attack one another, that they would continue technological development, probably most significantly on tank production. The Russians built very good tanks, especially at this time, and the Germans did too, and they worked together. Um, and they also secretly agreed to partition Poland. The, the Russians knew that Germany was about to invade Poland, just like everybody else. And by partition Poland, we mean like basically the eastern almost half, not quite half, but the eastern half would go back to the Soviet Union, the western half, including the what's known as the corridor, which is where Danzig is, you know, what connects East Prussia to Pomerania in Berlin area in Germany, all that would go back to Germany. So that's in a nutshell what the Molotov Ribbentrop Pact was. I kind of now want to talk about like, okay, what did France do? Like, what could France have done differently? And I kind of already mentioned, and Colin, the first question that I kind of asked you to open up our discussion, I kind of mentioned how France, even though they had a lot of left leaning parties, they were not communist. Uh, and they, they didn't, generally speaking, didn't like the government in the Soviet Union, even though it was kind of obvious that they needed to be friendly to the Soviet Union for their national security more so than anything else. So I guess my question is, like, how important is it for countries to work with countries that they don't like? I think it's yeah. – if you've ever heard the old ad, adage, worry about the alligator closest to the boat, mm -hmm. um, this kind of this reminds me of that situation where if I'm France, I'm looking at the Germans as now a rapidly growing military – a rapidly growing military with a leader who has made it extremely and abundantly clear that they want more. I look at the Russians on the other side of this very obvious enemy as somebody who could balance them. You know, it goes back to the alliance system you had in World War I. <clears throat> you know, Russia, Great Britain, and France kind of balanced these central powers, as they were called in World War I. It's kind yeah. of the same thing. That's really what they should have resurrected because at the worst case scenario, you know, you defeat the Germans and then you're face to face with the Russians, which, oh, by the way, that actually is what how World War II ended with the Cold War, where the, mm. the allies were basically on the border with the Russians or the, the Soviets. Should right. call them. And it seems like they were extremely short-sighted in recognizing the fact that it is either the Germans are going to come and attack Poland and France next and become an extremely dangerous enemy on our doorstep, you know, and, but instead of acting on that and reaching out to the Russians to try and be the counter, they didn't. And that allowed the Germans to say, okay, well, we're going to go make an alliance with the Russians. So we no longer have to worry about them. If you remember in World War One, and I'll just briefly mention this, I think it was the Schlieffen plan. They said they had like, I can't remember if it was like 90 days. It was sometime around like 90 days that they had to knock the French out so they could turn around and face the Russians. So they had to take Paris, sack Paris, overthrow the French government and turn around. And that was their plan to fight a war on two fronts was, you know, knock one of them out so quickly that you can turn around and fight the other one. Obviously, they got bogged down in uh, Belgium and they got stopped, the miracle on the Marne. Um, 
But in World War II, because the French did not build an alliance, a real alliance with the Russians, Hitler was like, well, I don't have to worry about that now. I can come, I can focus solely on Poland, which is going to be nothing. And then I can turn all of my attention to France. Right. Yeah. I think I like, I like how you started off by saying you got to address the alligator closest to the boat because when you're like, when trying to think about this situation, like, is it important to, or even helpful to make deals with countries that you might be fundamentally at odds with? Mm. Are, is the, are the trade-offs worth it? Then I think it really is a question of like, okay, how urgently do you need what they have? Now, in this instance, you know, hindsight being 2020, we know for a fact that France needed the Soviet Union. A Franco-Soviet alliance, which was attempted prior to, may have made World War II turn out a lot differently, uh, if if even happened at all, right? But that's that's hindsight. That was difficult for them, especially the French, to see at that time. Uh, maybe more willful ignorance than anything. And you know, Stalin trusted Hitler. Interestingly enough, like he believed when he signed the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact that he was good. That he just like completely saved his country from war. And as an aside, when the Nazis later broke the pact in '41 and attacked them. Apparently, like Stalin went into hiding in his DACA and like didn't talk to anybody for weeks. He was just like so mentally devastated that, you know, he was caught so uh, by surprise in Hitler's betrayal that he like had a complete breakdown. And in the time that his country needed leadership the most, he was like gone for weeks. Weeks, not days, weeks. And then he like finally came back and like got his act together and was like, all right, we need to we need to do something now and repel the invader. But anyway, um, I guess what I'm trying to say is like urgency plays a big role in this in this question. Another another kind of case in point that popped into my mind is China today. Like we do not we don't like communists, <laughs> generally speaking. But, you know, in 1979, Richard Nixon, a Republican, flew over there, met with Mao Zedong. We have a whole podcast episode on it and was very buddy-buddy with Mao. And the reason why was because we saw the Soviet Union as a bigger threat. But there's long-term consequences to that, right? Yeah, there's long-term consequences to that. And Long-term consequences are one thing if you feel like you're, you have an existential threat, which, you know, 1979 with the Soviet Union, you know, this is, we are still in mutually assured destruction, you know, nuclear weapons, pink mist and a memory type deal. And we were, we, the United States were highly incentivized to go fly over to Beijing and try to make buddy, buddy with Mao, Mao, a guy who is literally up there in this the same pantheon of devils as Stalin and Hitler. <laughs> Gorbachev and Khrushchev are not in that pantheon. I mean, I think they were poor leaders, but like Stalin was next level bad. And so was Mao. Like the, the Cultural Revolution and Great Leap Forward kind of show that that dude was cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs. But anyway, the point being is was that the right call? I think in our episode on Nixon and Mao, I think we said that it wasn't the right call. We'll have to go back and listen because we were look, keeping in mind the long-term consequences and how we enabled China's economic rise to be the world's second largest economy per GDP, per total GDP. And, you know, there's a lot of U.S. dollars that went into that country to kind of make that happen, and we might be regretting it now. But going back to France, like they were in an imminent threat, and they didn't make the deal with the devil, and it didn't play out for them so well. I, I don't even call it a deal with the devil. It's geopolitical survival. You know, yeah, a deal with the devil is you get tricked into something. This is like, well, we are definitely screwed right now if we don't. Yeah, we might be later if we do. I'll take might be later to buy some time if we if we can get it. Yeah. So here's an interesting thought. You know, at in August of 1939, it kind of is 
not even up for debate that France was in the middle of an existential crisis. Like their enemy was on the doorstep, right? And their military, like violence was coming for them. Who, who is that to the United States today? Like maybe not enemy on our doorstep, but like who is the most likely China entity? See, I don't, I don't think so. So here, here's my thought. Again, there's a great book, and I think we've mentioned it, called Unrestricted Warfare. It was written by two Chinese colonels, mm, yeah. and it basically talks about how you would bring down the United States, and <laughs> because they recognized that they couldn't do it through violence like the like the Germans could to France in World War II, but there's a lot of other ways that they can hurt the U.S. and mm. um, hurt the U.S., destroy the U.S., and become the hegemon. Like we we all know that that's their their goal. Like global hegemony. So a defeat to the US does not necessarily mean that, you know, the Chinese are are landing at Norfolk and they're marching to DC. Defeat to the Chinese could very simply be like, we have lost our status, we've lost our mm-hmm. money, and this this incredible lifestyle that most Americans live is now no more. And you are now gonna going to have to kowtow as a country to the Chinese because they now call the shots economically, militarily, all through all of these different means, and they never had to fire a shot, right? Yeah. So that's why I say they're the ones that they have the population to do it. They have the infrastructure to do it. They're, they're now reaching out. They have the trade network set up. It, it just kind of looks at it where you, you look at it and you think, yeah, of, of all the countries that could, that would be them. It yeah. may not be, again, it's not going to be them blitzkrieg in the west coast or no. landed at norfolk nobody's going to do that but well not right now but if we get knocked down a couple pegs for a long long time who knows what yeah. can happen so uh, that's that's why I, I think it is you know people people talk about the russians and it's like well it's a country of 170 million people with they just don't have the logistics to even even if they did have the army and the capabilities, they don't have the logistics to get here. And I don't think that's what they want to do. The Chinese do want to be the world power. They're right. They couldn't even get to Kiev. <laughs> there you go. And, and I mean yeah. that's that's the thing. And but China doesn't have to get doesn't have to get anywhere, you know, to be to be the biggest threat to the US. And suddenly they yeah, knock um, us down a peg or two and and then what? Well, how do we how do we finance all of these this military, how do we finance all of these, this foreign aid? What are we going to do here? It's like, well, suddenly we've got a lot of problems, right? Yeah. I, I, I know you're convinced now. I, I gotcha. No, I'm convinced you. <laughs> you do do that sometimes. <laughs> you do sometimes change my mind on the fly in this podcast, but, and I'm not saying I necessarily disagree with you, but like, the or at least like i don't disagree with the tack that you're taking i think i do disagree with the fact that it's going to be china because um you know when i when i first asked that question i was thinking more of like you know the french style collapse i.e like our entire military just falls apart and we get kind of overtaken by like militarily overtaken by an adversary that honestly folks is just super unrealistic like in the same way that has not happened to Great Britain since 1066, it's probably even more unlikely that that's going to happen in the United States. Uh, totally not worried about the Canadians nor the Mexicans for that reason. But I agree with the way the United States is is going to fundamentally change the way that we know it. It's not going to be via a military invasion it's going to be so there's first the we are no longer the global hegemon in the sense that the dollar's being the global currency english is the lingua franca everyone watch movies made out of hollywood taylor swift is like the most popular person in the in, you know celebrity in the world like there's all those you know, intangible, I guess some are tangible ways, you know, the United States is the dominant force in the country or sorry, in the world. Uh, and maybe we're just like, even getting down, knocked down to number two would be a big loss in a sense. Um, I think, uh, it's more, I honestly could see Europe 
taking that role again, believe it or not, before China does. And the reason why I say that is to kind of bring it full circle here. I don't believe it. (laughs) Is because China is, I mean, dude, how many times have we talked about how rough the Chinese economy is right now? We've talked about the corruption. Like they've had, they had 20 years of, you know, exponential growth that, that to be a hundred percent honest, nobody can independently verify. A lot of that is self-reported Chinese numbers that are highly suspicious. But it's true. A lot of people have made a lot of money in China. So there has been growth. I'm not saying it's a complete facade, but like the extent of the growth is up for debate. And you know, when you look at future projections of China, it's not good, man. Like there's no um yeah. There's no there's no there's a lot of reasons to be extremely pessimistic about the next 50 years. China's population I mean, we've talked about this not on the podcast before, but like they're looking at China's population being half of what it currently is by 2050. And you know what's crazy? I, I think we've talked about this before. I think we, you know, growth rate, you know, growth rates and fertility rates, but those are like projections based on current trends. Like if you've watched the trends and the projections, they've always had to correct them almost worldwide for like every country, even with high birth rates, high birth rates, look because they keep getting lower and lower than what they expect. So if you have a, on paper, a birth rate of 0.8 or 0.7, like in South Korea now, but suddenly that dips unexpectedly to like a 0.5 or a 0.4, it's going to get a lot worse. And suddenly that, that half a billion or number, it becomes a couple hundred million below, you know, now you're the size of the US. And nobody nobody in modern society is ready for ghost cities at the scale that is going to happen if depopulation occurs like that. No. And it and it honestly is a concern, which, you know, even kind of bringing this back to France, like we I think we talked in our very first episode, the birth rate in France tanked um in in the late eighteen hundreds to where they were, I believe their fertility rate was just above one which your fertility rate has to be above two just to maintain your current population, not considering immigration. Um, that's why the United States' population has continued to grow despite us having like right around a two fertility rate, I believe, maybe under, because we have extremely liberal immigration policies. <laughs> that, that's uh, about it. We our, our birth rate, even actually I saw this amongst like first and second generation immigrants, dips uh, below the 2.1 number. Right. Which is why we have to have more immigrants coming in. Right. Which is why no one in Congress is actually incentivized to fix this problem. But that's a different tangent. <laughs> Back the French to didn't the French didn't have a big immigration issue per se, but they definitely had a big birth rate issue. Um anyway, I think kind of bringing this back to the question on like, you know, what what should France have done differently at this time? And I, and Colin, again, I just I think you framed it really well at the beginning. And that is, you know, there are closer alligators to a boat, uh, and you know, you have Nazi Germany on your doorstep. So I I think it would have been beneficial for them to make a deal with the Soviet Union. Did that you know deal have to carry on for decades? No. You know, we now know that even at this time and before this time, there were a lot of people in the the Nazi government that did not like Hitler, that wanted Hitler out. There were multiple coups being planned, multiple like high level officials that were planning coups. You know, there's no guarantee that if World War II had not have happened, that Hitler wouldn't have been as- ousted from power. So yeah, I think I think France should have made a military alliance with the Soviet Union instead of doing the him and and Han. Do you agree, or you think one hundred percent agree? Yeah, yeah one hundred percent. Yeah, and and I guess like the lesson learned here for the United States is like, you know, a lot of times you have to not disregard but be pragmatic. As opposed to idealistic, you know, there's a lot of people on the political right in France at this time that would have been like an alliance with the Soviets. Yeah, right. We should be going to war with the Soviets like they're commies, you know, type deal. But it's like your pragmatism has got to win the day because 
Um, you need to survive the day. That's what you, you need have to, to survive. Do. Yeah, no, I agree. Okay, let's shift gears here and let's let's talk about some of those internal political um, uh, considerations. I want to read a quote from William Scher's "The Collapse of the." of the third Republic, which has been my source, this entire series, phenomenal book um, that I think, you know, this quote kind of captures really well, especially post Molotov Ribbentrop, just how divided France was. And we've talked about it before in this series, but I feel like we haven't talked about it in the last episode or two, at least not that much. And that is, you know, one reason why French leaders were so paralyzed to make big decisions was because they were so worried about their own internal divisions. So this 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 quote, this paragraph that I'm about to read, is kind of Schur's take on the paradoxes that French politics were facing post Molotov Ribbentrop. He writes to the forces of the right who opposed the war, World War II, because they hated the Republic and looked kindly on Hitler and Mussolini, were soon joined by those on the communist left, millions of them, who, though they felt betrayed by Stalin, resented the harassment of the police, the courts, and the government, which treated them as outlaws. They too turned against the war, sabotaged the armament factories, and sowed defeatism in the armed services until Hitler attacked Russia and it was too late to help save their country. So I think kind of what he shows is that like one reason amongst others that France was so divided was that entities on both the right and the left had strong, compelling reasons to hate not just the political party in power, but the entire political institution of the Third Republic itself. The people on the right were sympathetic to Hitler and Mussolini. And they, you know, these are the old monarchists. You know, in, in our first episode, we talked about how the monarchists were the ones that, you know, were the, basically the political right. And they're the ones that formed, that turned into fascists. So they were, by and large, so they... Uh, were wanted France to be friendly to Hitler and Mussolini. But then on the communist left, like they also saw Hitler as an enemy. But then when Stalin made this pact to him, they felt betrayed. But the the we haven't really talked too much about this in detail, but the prime minister, Deladier, was like kind of a conservative leaning moderate. And he decided to suppress the communists wanted to, you know, ban their newspapers, prevent them from gathering publicly, that kind of thing. And so if you're a communist and a and a social, you know, a, an actual socialist in France at this time, you can't even like gather politically with like-minded individuals. Your papers are being, you know, banned from being distributed like you're being a pre- politically oppressed in a sense. So the Third Republic did a very good job of isolating and repelling both sides of the political spectrum. It's interesting that that looks almost exactly like the U.S. now. If we're talking about yeah. questions, it's kind of like, well, when you ask, like, what should the French have done? It's like, well, was anybody really thinking for the good of France, which is probably why they didn't really do anything. And they put all their faith in Poland, which we'll get to in a minute. but. It's sort of like the far left, far right, in the middle. Basically, all of the French couldn't think beyond their immediate politics to understand like they there was doom on the horizon, right? So, it, does it's that contradict like, what we just said? <laughs> no, 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 I, no, no, no. Hold, hold on, let me flesh this out. Here's what I'm saying: okay. like they couldn't, they couldn't, uh, they couldn't understand, they couldn't fully accept that there were even alligators out there. So to use my analogy of like you got to handle what the the alligator closest to the boat, they were so worried about their own politics that they weren't even really looking outside of their own little boat in the situation. They couldn't even assess the situation. So putting on in terms of the U.S., think about it. Like right now, you have people who are like, I don't really. I'm sympathetic to Putin because I hate the way the U.S. is acting now. Mm-hmm. I'm yep. I am pro-Putin because, or I'm I'm anti-Putin, I should say, because 
you know, the TV told me to, or, you know, this politician said so. It's kind of like, well, is that really, is this the issue more nuanced than that? Is there a bigger problem at play here? And we kind of are in, end up fighting each other. And meanwhile, meanwhile, in my opinion, you've got the Chinese that are growing ever stronger. You have the Russians who, despite everything we say, have, I would argue, that are probably in a better position than they were, say, 10 years ago. Um, you know, and that tracks and it's kind of like, hey, right now the enemies are growing. And I would say that's the real alligator closest to the boat is the fact that you've got enemies right now circling you and you're too busy squabbling internally to to recognize it just like France was. They had, you know, dissidents on the far left who were felt betrayed and they didn't really know what they wanted to do with Stalin. And you had uh, dissidents on the right who wanted to support Hitler. And meanwhile, there, he's just going to roll tanks into Paris. Yeah. I don't know if any of that made sense, but I just wanted no. it just sounds so <clears throat> eerily similar to today where we can't even make a coherent decision yeah. because we're so internally focused. Yeah. So it's kind of funny because like so many things here on the ones of history, <laughs> there's, there's so many things that are different, but there's a lot of similarities in mm. What popped in my head when you said that this is exactly what's going on today, I was reminded, um, you know, we've talked about before, Colin and I are millennials, right? Like we're a little bit older, but we're not that old, (laughs) right? And I remember the Clinton years. I remember the W. Bush years. I remember some of the campaign characterizations Especially in what popped in my head was the election of 2000. Bush's, you know, when Bush was running the first time, post Clinton. Yeah. So, election of 2000. And there is a. So, Colin, I'm really curious what your opinion is on this. <laughs> I, I consider myself on the right. However, I love Rage Against the Machine. <laughs> Well, they're raging for the machine now. Yeah, they're raging for the machine now. But like one, just musically, their music is fantastic. Gorilla uh, Radio is is fantastic. But Bulls have you parade. ever? Yes. Incredible. Love it. Have you seen the music video to their song Testify? So Testify. Yeah. You know the song. That was great. I know call. the song. I don't think I've ever <laughs> seen the video. So the music video, they do this really interesting thing where they put George Bush's face on, you know, in the in the music video, but then they kind of spin it to where it turns into Al Gore, but then it spins back to be George Bush. And it's like, I think the point, I think it's a spin, maybe it's a fade. I'm a little blurry, but like they take both of their faces and they very clearly communicate like these faces are interchangeable. And I think what what Rage was communicating was like American politics has become like it's all bad because you're fundamentally getting the like the two options are the same option. Not saying I agree with that a hundred percent, but I remember a little bit later they saw that in two thousand. I remember the election of was it twenty twelve when was it McCain? Ran against Obama. Twenty. No, he was two thousand eight. Two thousand twelve was Romney versus Obama. Romney. Okay, yeah, it was Romney. I remember Romney and Obama. For some reason, I thought that this was maybe during the primaries, but yeah, that makes more sense. It was Romney and Obama were doing a town hall, and all I could think about was I was like, "Are they saying anything different? I feel like they're just in violent agreement with one another." <laughs> It, it feels like the same candidate here. It was super well, weird. Practically speaking, like what was different about Bush and Obama? Obamacare, but I mean, yeah, that was about just it. A war in Iraq, speaking, you know. <laughs> well, no, no, a war in Iraq. But did Obama continue that? I mean, we were already oh, drawing down from Iraq. Oh, he was yes. still dropping bombs. Everywhere. He made it ten times worse. It, I mean, think about the Arab Spring. It's like we didn't. See, Yes, the actions were different, but the yes. intent was still the same. The Middle East was still wildly destabilized. What was different about foreign policy? Yeah. There was literally no difference. We're just yes. going to destabilize it in different ways. What, what's the difference? What's the difference yes. between Joe Biden right now and Barack Obama and George Bush? And then you go back to Bill Clinton, you're like, oh, it's, oh, yeah. it's kind of all the same. Dude, I would even, and I know you may not like this, but I would even throw Trump in that whole thing. And this is, and honestly, it's kind of funny. 
Trump as a person is extremely different. But what did Trump do in office? Like I, I actually liked Trump's policies in office. It is policies like a, a great case in point is withdrawing from Afghanistan. Like Obama said he was going to withdraw from Afghanistan. Trump said he was going to withdraw from Afghanistan. Biden said he was going to withdraw from Afghanistan. Like they all said, like what appears to be wildly different political positions on this on this one given issue. They all said the exact same thing. Um, Trump was very isolationist. Like he very much uh, was going for the, you know, we got to pull out of the Middle East, just like Obama, just like Biden. Are there other like other areas in which they're different? Sure. But like, I guess to your, I'm, I'm in violent agreement with you in, 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 in the broader point. And that is, I think in the same way that France pissed off everybody, <laughs> I think in a very real sense, that's kind of in the boat that we're in now is that we have a tendency to piss off. Both political parties have a tendency to just piss off. Everybody. There's there's zero social and political cohesion in the US now, just like there was in France. There was really, and you think about, you know, World War One. that was a, a devastating event. You talked about the birth rate. Well, I mean, you just lost the generation of men that were killed, severely wounded. They had PTSD. So you have this massive shortage so they're not going to have kids. You're going to have all sorts of kind of a, a post-war malaise where it just sort of sets in, you know, that, and that happened all over the world, you know, obviously the Great Depression. But, you know, you had this malaise. That, that's that's kind of what it feels like in France, a post-war malaise. And so there's zero social cohesion because everyone's kind of like they're still shell-shocked from collectively from World War One, um, And so, the, you know, that manifests politically where they can't actually really do anything externally because they can't figure out what to do internally. They, they're all pointing the finger at each other. There's no cohesion. So it's like the US. It's like, well, you know, uh, the wars we have fought have been far less costly than World War One or World War Two. But, you know, it's like, well, we've been in conflict for a while. You know, we've got all these other things going on. There's no social cohesion. So how can we possibly expect a politically cohesive policy to continue yeah. beyond two to two to four years? Yeah. You know what? And you know, it's funny, this thought just occurred to me and not during all, uh, not during my prep at all. And that is, do you think the reason why there's no social cohesion is because there's very little reason to be proud of being an American? Oh man, we're about to go down another tangent. Here. Oh shoot, Colin. <laughs> <laughs> um, because here, real quick, before, before you answer in France, he, in, in sure talks about this in 1914. Everyone, both sides of the political spectrum, wanted to stand up to Germany. In 1939, that was not the case. Like half the country didn't, and part of it was because they they weren't proud to be French. Like there was the they were not proud of the Third Republic at all. Go ahead. Case in point with the U.S. right now. Look at the recruiting numbers. They are mm. abysmal. The military. I, I don't know if they're in like a they're bad unquote, panic about it but yes <laughs> if you were if you were to look at it and this is the example I always tell people I'm like if you're 15,000 soldiers short and I think that was the 2022 numbers maybe 23 for the army of the 60,000 new recruits they were like 15,000 short it's like if a war started in 3 to 4 years that's fifth that if in 4 years if a war started and you only had 15,000 short every year you are now 60,000 troops short. And not only are you 60,000 troops short, but you're 60,000 troops short of your, of really the backbone of your military, the ones that are pulling the trigger. It's not some retired old colonel or sergeant major. It's, yeah. you know, that you're just sticking in and holding on to, to maintain numbers. It's like, these are the young men and women that are going to do the real fighting, do the, yeah. do the dirty work. And yeah. they're not there. There's nobody's there. And I know we want to automate so much of it. It's like you can only do so automate so much. And it's like you don't have those numbers. Who's actually going to go fight this war? Yeah. Who's actually going to go fight the Chinese when they invade Taiwan? Who's going to go fight the North Koreans when they storm the 38th parallel? Right. Who's going to go fight you know in the next Middle Eastern war when Hezbollah and Iran start running wild? Right. Who's going to fight the Russians when they say, I don't think NATO is actually going to do anything? You have to really ask yourself, is it, are Americans really going to want to fight that war? Because A, I, I've observed it. On the left, I think most Americans aren't – they 
have already had a disdain for what America is and what they believe it to be. And then on the right, it's kind of what it's become with, you know, whatever woke policy they want to call it. They're they've kind of they're kind of disgusted what it's what it's become, and then left is like what it was. So that either way, they both they both end up hating what it is now. Um, so they don't want to join and they don't want to fight because I'm not going to die for slogans. You know, you know, like we yeah. I remember you know you and I were growing up during this when it was like we're spreading democracy, and now you look back and you're like, what 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 democracy were we spreading? You know, what was the point of that? We killed half a million people and a lot of people on our side lost, you know, were wounded or died or paid the ultimate price. It's like, it was it worth it for, you know, these, um, for these slogans. And it's like, what do I have at home that I want to fight to defend or even further? It's like, well, I mean, I'm basically an economic zone. I can't stand the other political parties and that's half the country. You know, if I'm on the left, I hate the right. If I'm on the right, I hate the left. It's like I have zero common ground. And at this point, it's no longer like like in the Civil War when we had the Antebellum South episodes. It's not like South Carolina, you know, the Confederacy versus the Union. Now it's like, hey, I don't like my neighbor. He's yeah. he's one of those guys. He voted for that yeah. person. So yeah. there's literally no – there's not even a community that you can surround yourself, like a real tangible community you can surround yourself with anymore because everybody's permanently online or – or, you know, there's just nothing that really can hold you together that you can meet with in your neighborhood, your state or whatever, let alone yeah. your country. So why is anybody going to want to join and go fight? They're just yeah. not going to do it. And now we're – and I, it's only going to get worse. Man, in yeah. four years, we're going to be lucky if we're even able to make 50% of our number. I, I am willing to bet the kit – Gen Z is too fat. They're we too are, medicated up. Yeah, they the are, last – the last yeah. article that I saw was the army was at 40% of their numbers. So it's like, we're, I think we're already below 50%. Recruiting. Wow. That's, that's, <laughs> Hey, you know what? We talked about the collapse of Rome. We talked about the collapse of Rome. <laughs> you know, we're trying all this together. Yeah. They stopped wanting to fight. They didn't want to fight for yep, Rome anymore. You're right. Hey, let's let you're the right. Visigoths go fight our battles. How'd that work out mm, for them? It didn't. It didn't at all. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Look at the French. The French were like, you know, and you know, I, you know, I do remember seeing photos, and you know, I think they've done some of those restoration of some videos where you would see like French soldiers in the streets marching to go fight the Germans, and they were proud, and there were flags flying, and it was almost kind of like the death of patriotism in Europe in World mm. War One. Really, World War Two was kind of a, a war of necessity, but World War One was like the death of patriotism in a lot of ways. Yeah. You know, I. I remember during Trump's term in office, people talked about nationalism and populism like they were dirty words. Not not to give like too mi- too much detail, but like the the demographics of where I live are highly educated, not necessarily wealthy, but it is a little bit mm-hmm. higher cost of living, I'll say that. But m- higher education is really the the bigger point of what I'm trying to get at a lot of like elitism. And I'm from, like I said before, and especially on our Annabelle South episodes, I'm from a small town in North Carolina and like the hoity torty, like I'm better than you just has always rubbed me the wrong way, even though I currently live here now. Uh, But the reason why I bring that up is when nationalism and populism in like some circles that I was hanging around, uh, you know, they use these terms like they're dirty words. And it always like rubbed me the wrong way because I'm like, wait a minute, what you called populism, I call democracy, <laughs> where the will of the people is most fully expressed. And just because the people voted for someone that you don't like doesn't mean that representative government is all of a sudden a bad idea. So let's not forget that folks. But then nationalism, you know, to your point, Colin, it's like, when did patriotism and being proud of your country become a bad thing? Uh, And my my thought on this question is like, why are we not proud of of being an American anymore? Is because we there's no person, there's no institution articulating a positive vision for who we are as a country. As in 2020, and I and I remember I was actually not living in this country during 2020. I was actually living in Japan during that time. Fantastic, fantastic. I think I've said on this podcast before, Japan's a great country. But in 2020, I remember thinking like all the all the protests, all the taking a knee, all the like burning the flag, all this stuff. And I remember thinking like, you know, this is bad. 
that people are not like proud to be an American. Like that it's bad that people are think it's perfectly acceptable to disrespect the flag that frankly represents all of us. Like it's who we are, right? And I and I'm not saying I agree, but I do understand as you know on the 2020, like I do understand the message that they were trying to send. I I don't agree with the message they were trying to send, but I do understand that they were like, this symbol represents racism. It represents oppression. It represents white cops killing black dudes, blah, 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 blah. Um, I get it. I don't agree with it, but I get it. But at the same time, it's like, you know, there are like this country is so much bigger than that. Like we are a country that's done jacked up things. And we need to address it. You know, again, we talked about it in our Antebellum South podcast. Like, we want to call a spade a spade. And where bad things happen, like, we we want to address that. And we need to address that if we're going to heal as a country. But at the same time, like, this country used to stand for something. Like, this country, first and foremost, stood for liberty. And it stood for freedom. And it stood for, you know, having a representative government that protected the rights of its citizens that were given those rights being given to them by God, not by their government. I think that was trending on Twitter the other day because somebody was like, it's a bad thing. Like rights didn't come from God, you idiots. And it's like, that's literally in the, in the declaration of independence, (laughs) Uh, but, or is it the constitution or both? Anyway. (laughs) Well, I think, Uh, yeah, I mean, yeah, that's, we have a whole episode on that natural law too, where we talk about that, where some of our fundamental rights come from. Way back when. That was one of my more favorite episodes that we've done, Colin. Oh, yeah. The, like, the political philosophy behind the Constitution and, and all that stuff. That was a, that was a good series. I enjoy, really enjoyed that one. You know, like I said, people are not going to die for slogans. They're not going to die for GDP. They're not going to die for something that is not tangible. Like you have to have – a country. So like nationalism, people people always attribute it to a racial or ethnic group. And it's like, no, it goes really far beyond that. Like yeah. think back to the quote unquote nationalism post 9-11 when it was like, we're all American. We're in this. Let's go get him. Like, oh, sign me up. I was yeah. 10 years old. And it's like, let's go. Let's go. You know, Toby Keith was singing and <laughs> we'll everybody was American. <laughs> And it's like in 20 years, things really shifted and went downhill oh, yeah. very quickly. And it, it was like whatever – people wanted to go fight them because they had a shared sense of country and community. They don't have mm. it now. They're not going to go yeah. fight. People People won't. And they people, are, I think, are generally speaking going to revert to you know, whatever they see as their nation. And that's not the U.S. right now. Yeah. So that's why not a lot of people are signing up. It's only going to get worse like you mentioned. Yeah, I think that is that is a huge factor that we will definitely come back to when we talk when we sum, summarize the lessons that come out of the fall of the French Third Republic is <clears throat> you know, you you can have your opinion on nationalism or 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 any of that kind of stuff, but it's like when the when the population is not proud of their country, your country's in trouble. And in the same way that we talked about it in the fall of the Han dynasty, like when there are very few people within your country who want the current structure to continue, like your odds of the current structure falling apart are significantly increased. Um, uh, As a matter of fact, if there's people like actively trying to bring it about, which was the case in the Han dynasty. I think in the French, you know, obviously it was an external force that came in and wrecked their, wrecked their government. But as we'll see in either our last or second to last episode, you know, with, with Patain or Patan, I don't know how to say his name. Uh, you know, you did have some of these French men on the right who were invested in the, in the fall of the Republic and setting up Vichy France. But uh, yeah, here in the United States, it's, you know, it's a shame that, you know, primarily on the left, it's like a dirty word to be proud of an American. And it's a shame that, uh, um, you know, a consequence of trying to motivate people politically to vote for your party is you have to talk bad about the very country that you represent that does not vote well for our country at all. I, and I guess to kind of sum up the point before we start talking about Poland and the time that we have remaining, 
is I would l- really like to see someone articulate a positive vision and not a negative vision. And to be 100% honest, I don't think Trump communicates a positive vision very well. He's He is extremely skilled at casting a negative vision for articulating what exactly is wrong with the left. People he's, hate mudslinging, but it works. Yes, it works. And he's better at it than anybody. Like maybe in the last 50 years, probably, but he's, he's so good at it. Everyone loves it when he trash talks CNN. Um, but that's, that's still a negative vision and it's not going to unite the country. It might bulldoze half the country and it might not. But anyway, I, I think that's one reason why it's hard for me to, you know, really start getting excited about Trump because he doesn't articulate a positive vision. He articulates a negative vision. I want to see somebody articulate a positive vision of, and what that, that doesn't mean never talks bad about the opposing side, because like, again, you got to call a spade a spade and, you know, there's always going to be some sense of mudslinging, but the mudslinging has to be subordinate to casting like, Hey, this is who we are as a country. This is the vision that I see us going. This is what, this is the vision that I have for our domestic affairs, for our foreign affairs, for what does it look like to combat fentanyl and drug overdoses? What does it look like to, you know, as a matter of fact, immigration is a great case in point for Trump because, you know, do we not want immigrants to come into this country? That just seems like a really bad idea. Like we should want immigrants to come in but we want them to come in legally <laughs> and we want them to come in like we want to have some kind of regulation over the border so that not just anybody can come in because there's threats there right uh, not to mention the drug trafficking and and terrorism ish concerns and so on and so forth like we want immigrants so like let's actually fix immigration as opposed to just you know I think both sides have a negative vision for immigration right now. You know, the 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 war in Russia Ukraine, it's like okay, the you know, Biden wants us to fight for Ukraine and one reason why I think he's struggling, it's like why? Why do we like we won't talk about like uh in in one instance, I mean, I'm personally for supporting U- Ukraine. I'm just commenting that I think the current administration has done a, a fairly poor job of casting a positive vision for why we should be supporting Ukraine. Uh, and I think the Republicans have cast a very good negative vision. And when I say good, is mean like it's been successful, a good negative vision for why we shouldn't support Ukraine. But by I think the the trade-off to that is like those same arguments that Republicans use for not supporting Ukraine are the exact same arguments that you can use for why we shouldn't support Taiwan. And yet, interestingly enough, I'm pretty sure if you were to ask some Republicans privately, because I'd never say this publicly, but privately, if you were to ask them, should we like become military involved in def- in defending Taiwan, they'd probably say yes. So it's like, what's the where's the vision, or is it just political theatrics and convenience? So I, I guess what to kind of close up this point <laughs> before we wrap up with Poland, that is just like, I really want to see a positive vision. I really want to see somebody for the love of God to articulate like, this is what it means to be an American for everybody. And not just like one, one group, but for, for all of us, maybe that'll be you Colin. (laughs) Someday. Ladies and gentlemen, I know you can't see Colin, but he's a very handsome man. You got the face face for for radio, brother. You have a face. No, you don't. Um. Okay. Uh, all right. Hey, real quick, let's just, let's cover Poland. Um, and this, I just wanted to read a quick paragraph and kind of put this in juxtaposition to what we were saying about Russia. So this is on the question of whether or not France should have gone to war over Poland or not. So if, if y'all remember the former foreign, French foreign minister, a guy named Flandon, he was the foreign minister during the real remilitarization of the Rhineland. He was still in parliament. Excuse me. And he was still very politically active, although he was not in the cabinet. And he had a conversation kind of on the sidelines with the prime minister, Deladier. 
This is his recollection of that. This is Flandon's recollection of that conversation. He says, I had a long conversation with him, Gladier, and pointed out the diplomatic situation so unfavorable to France. Her inferior military position, the additional trouble with the Russian defection, especially in regard to the attitude of the French Communist Party, was going to cause the mor- was going to harm the morale of the nation. I found him quite calm and objective. He disputed neither the unpreparedness of the army nor the deficiencies in the Air Force. He insisted that the question of Danzig and the corridor had little importance. It was not bigger than that. Poland was our last ally in the East. The German general staff wished to eliminate the second front of France's security before attacking France herself. He believed the Polish army, the Polish army would put up an honorable resistance. I disputed it, but he opposed me with the opinion of General Gamlaw. And I read that quote because in when I was reading this quote stood out to me because Flandon says he's like Deladier knew. He's like he's not even trying to argue that our military doesn't suck. He's not even trying to argue that the that the, you know, Danzig doesn't actually, in the corridor, West Prussia doesn't actually matter. Rather, Deladier was saying, we will need to go over war to war over Poland precisely because we can't afford, uh, you know, to abandon our last ally in the East because we know we're next. And I guess the, the question here is, you know, we kind of already mentioned we both believe that France should have made an alliance with the Soviet Union. But should at that point, after it was clear that, you know, there was going to be no alliance with the Soviet Union, should France have maintained their defensive pact, you know, technically a guarantee with Poland, or should they have reneged on that as well? What uh, What are your thoughts, Colin? This is one of those situations where they wouldn't have been in this situation if we had gone back, you know, gone back <laughs> to last week's episode and done yeah. something about it in 33 or 36, yep. or 37, yep. 38. Now here we are in 39. Like at this point, Poland should not have – they overestimated Poland, right? Like yes. the whole thing was like they should have put their alliance in the Russians who – realistically and by every metric are the only ones that would have been able to really put up a challenge to the Germans, not the Poles. Like it was, it was just, they put too many eggs in one basket and they picked the worst possible basket to put their eggs in. Like, yeah, the Poles will stop them to hold off for six months and then we'll get the Brits involved. And then, you know, you know what I mean? It's just, it was just such a strategic blunder. I feel like, you know, they, I don't think they should renege on their alliances, but it's Mm -hmm. like, what was the point of the alliance? You made it with somebody that would not have been able to actually do anything. Like that's the right. whole point. You know, that's the whole problem. It's like, it, well, you, you can't back out now. You've already made the alliance, but why'd you ever get into that in the first place? Like, don't back out, but make better alliances, right. man. Come on, like, think, <laughs> come on, like, think about it. You know, you had in prior to World War One, and you, Dan Carlin has a pretty good podcast on on the lead up. And I know you've talked about Barbara Tuckman's Guns of August. Like mm. the alliance and the power structure was actually designed as a balance, like to offset. Like you had a massive imbalance of power right now, which is what led to this war. Like had the French been better diplomats and extended something to Stalin, even though they hated the communists, and I get it, like you still could have been a balance to the Germans, right? Like he wouldn't have been able to move with such impunity and operate, I should say, with such impunity because he would have had the threat of the Russians, which he no longer had at this point. Now he's like, I'm going to deal with them. So I'm going to go take Poland. And the French were like, well, we're screwed now. We have to get involved. So I I don't know if that answered really well. That was a really good answer to your question, but I don't know. I'm just baffled at the the lack of strategic vision. Yeah, you're right. I mean, it's, there's kind of the situation is very much a lose lose for France. There's no winning at this point. Like they've already, they have blundered their way into a lose 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 situation. And, and I definitely agree. But I, I will take it a step further and say I think France should have maintained, as they did, their guarantee with Poland. And the reason why I say that is do we honestly believe 
that after uh, a war with Poland that Hitler would have stopped there. Because I think, like, I think it was clear from even prior to Munich that Hitler was not going to stop, period. He wanted a war and he was just going to keep going and keep going and keep going. I don't think reneging on the guarantee to Poland would have saved France in the long run. I think it, it may have bought him another six months to a year. But to be 100% honest, they they wouldn't fall for another was it nine months and they did keep their um, uh, guarantee with Poland. So it's like, it wouldn't have even bought them any time to, uh, to renege on that promise. So I think the lesson learned here to be hundred percent honest is, is kind of similar to what we talked about in the Munich conference. And that is an alliance system is absolutely essential. And you can't treat the alliance system as a um, as tertiary as something to be expended, it it really is ab- like essential when it comes to national security. I think NATO is like do, should we, you know, pressure our NATO allies to pay their fair share? Absolutely. Um, should we, in you know, encourage them to? Uh, you know, include the U.S. in their agreements, you know, so on and so forth, you know, basing, that kind of thing. Yes, absolutely. Should we talk about pulling out of NATO? Heck no. And I don't, I think that was one of the more careless things the Trump administration did was, okay, you want to put pressure on them to pay their fair share? Good. That's, that is great. I think there were other ways that we could have done that than by saying we're just going to pull out of NATO and and so on and so forth. Because what that did was that just demonstrated a lack of unity that our adversaries just feed off of that. They see, you know, the Russians and the Chinese and the Iranians and the North Koreans, they see that, not to mention all the terrorist groups out there. They see that lack of unity as uh, like it emboldens them. It allows them to be more aggressive in in whatever they're doing, um, and that that you know erodes at our security. Is it decisive? No, but does it erode our security? Absolutely. I I don't think it's a coincidence that the one country in Eastern Europe that uh, wasn't a part of NATO is the country that got invaded. You know, Belarus being the exception, but they're friendly with, they're basically a puppet state of Russia. They basically are Russians. Right. (laughs) So, yeah, like it's, I think NATO, as an example, like our allies are extremely important. To be honest, the Gulf states are, you know, Saudi Arabia, Qatar, Bahrain, even Oman, UAE, like Oman is an interesting beast. And I'm by no stretch of imagination as a Middle East scholar or, or even an expert. But like, um, you know, Oman is extremely friendly with Iran. And, you know, they have a lot of pull over some of the other, the other states. You know, they share a border with Yemen, which is very problematic right now with the Houthis and Saudi Arabia, etc. Like... Those Gulf states have very much tried to distance themselves in the last, really, since 2016, and it's only continued. I don't think the Biden administration has reversed this trend in ways that are not favorable to us um, And because Iran is dangerous. Like, Iran is not – I mean, they they are a threat to us. They are a threat to – Israel, they're a threat to other like-minded democracies. You know, they they conduct terrorist activities in Europe, all sponsor terrorist activities in Europe all the time. They've they've committed assassinations. They're still threatening to assassinate Trump and General McKenzie and others. Like, um, you know, there's the stuff's in the news. So anyway, the 
when we when we don't show that unity with our allies, we embolden our adversaries. And I think that's the that's one of the reasons why like it wouldn't have appeased Hitler for us to back off or for France to back off of Poland. I think it just would have emboldened him to keep keep doing his thing. You gotta blow him up on an airfield. Heck yeah. Oh, the Soleimani strike was like one of the best decisions we've ever made, for sure. No, I know. You gotta blow him up on an airfield. Just hey, you knew what you were doing, Bao. See yeah. ya. Yeah. I great decision. You know, it was also a great decision putting a like 50 plus T lambs in the Russian airfield in Syria. Love it. <laughs> yeah. I read about, was that the battle of the Conoco fields or something like that? Is that what they called it? No, 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 no. That's when the, the Navy ships out in the Mediterranean fired over 50 T lambs oh. into a Russian airfield because that the Russians were, I don't know if it was immediately in the aftermath of when we, oh, I think some U.S. Army Special Forces like completely obliterated some Wagner. Uh, no, no, dudes. that was the that was the Battle of Conoco Fields. Like they, it was a combined strike. So you had all of those T lambs. You had no, um, no, no. The T lambs were were after that. So the okay, T lambs were that, not a, that not battle the same that time you're talking that. about. It was yeah. like a, that outpost was Special Forces guys, they were getting attacked and then they just brought in like every air and artillery asset in the theater yeah. on top of like one square mile where the Wagner tr- troops were and then they were no longer there. Right. Yeah. Pink mist in a memory. <laughs> I, I want to say the T-Lambs came at, like after that. They may have been either a response to that or, or something like that. But anyway, point being is that like force is a language that everyone understands. And I actually saw there was a there was like a TikTok of some reporter making a snippy comment at a I think it was a State Department official was like giving the speech saying like the United States is not dictating to Israel what it should do. We've never gone into, you know, we've never told other countries what they need to do. And some like, you know, reporter out in, out in the cheap seats was like except when you invade them and honestly like the the official i don't remember if he's state department or not like he handled it pretty well but i this is why i'll never hold that office <laughs> the i almost want to be like well they freaking shouldn't have threatened us like <laughs> like you shouldn't have been having those weapons of mass destruction or at least, not and they didn't invading iraq was a bad idea folks but the the point being is like you know afghanistan like hey you freaking cooperate with terrorists like you're putting your own security at risk like we gotta do what we gotta do uh Anyway, and you're next. <laughs> your country. What country are you from? Report. Oh, yeah. yeah your country's next. <laughs> That's I think this could all be summed up that the French should have acted sooner. Speak softly and carry a big stick. And for the love of goodness, make some strategic alliances that make sense. Yes, and have a vision. A good vision. So just to kind of summarize what we've talked about. Uh, you know, this episode was, you know, what what got us to World War II, what got us to September 1st, 1939, when Germany invaded Poland from a from a fall of France perspective. Uh, we talked about the Montauk ribbentrop Pact. We talked about France's JV diplomacy that kind of drove Hitler and Stalin into high-fiving each other and patting each other on the butt. We talked about the political divides in the country we kind of talked about why we think that is we talked about what the u.s should do and taking those lessons learned into consideration and lastly real quick we talked about whether or not we should have defended poland um of which i think they should have i say we as if i'm french i'm not french i'm american <laughs> but yeah great episode Colin. thanks for the conversation yeah, it was good. It was a good conversation. And um, if you'd like to continue hearing our, these conversations, please like and subscribe on YouTube. Or if you leave a comment as well as a like on Spotify or Podcast Addict or Apple Podcasts, we'll be able to see you and give you a shout out. Same thing on YouTube. Or we're also on social media. So if you want to give us a follow, send us some feedback via Gmail or direct message. That's good. We we're active on social media from time to time. So we like to interact with fans and get some constructive criticism or suggestions or just get your feedback. And, uh, 
Next week, we're going to continue our series on the fall of the French Third Republic. We're going to get break into 1940, so it's going to be an ex- exciting episode to talk about and really a tragic fall of France that we're going to see. And some heroism, I don't think we're really going to touch on Dunkirk, but it's in and around that time period. So it be exciting stuff. So thank you for listening to The Loins of History, and we'll see you next week.